Okay, no, let me go I'm ahead wrong. and at least start with the preliminary part. My name is Ann Marquardt. I am part of the club of the Democrats. I'm also chair of the La Plata Democrats. The, this is our monthly club luncheon. The goal of the lunch of the club is to bring together all Democrats from most conservative to most progressive to celebrate our shared values, appreciate who we are and work together to put more Democrats in office. I would like to acknowledge our club luncheon sponsor, Albrechta and Albrechta Law. They have been supporting the lunch for several years now. If you need legal help, please think about them first. Our program today will be from local to national. We have a total of five speakers, which is a lot. So we're asking people to stay pretty much within their range of 10 minutes each. We're going to start um, with a super local presentation. As I said, I'll introduce the speakers in just a moment. Everyone is asked to stay muted except for speakers, myself and Gwyn Unger, who will be helping with questions. If you have a question to submit other than the ones we're asking during the lunch, or if you want to put something in the chat box, please use the chat box. Uh, do not unmute yourself unless we ask you to do so particularly. You can raise your hand. We'll try to recognize you as well. It just depends on the number of questions. If you're having trouble with your internet connectivity, yeah. you may want to disable your video. Audio only works better on slow connections. As Karen Pontius is finding out as she sits in a parking lot somewhere in the Midwest. The Zoom meeting is being recorded and will be available within a day or so for viewing. You can show typically in the upper right-hand corner of your screen to bring up a larger video of the person speaking. I'd like to encourage everyone to please donate to the La Plata Democrats in this non-election year. We still have expenses. We would really appreciate your support. It will help us ensure that 2024, we get great candidates in office. This is our third club luncheon for 2023. The committee is working hard to bring on some more great programs this year, both by Zoom and in person. If you have ideas of who you would like to invite, uh, please let us know. We're looking for ideas by all means. If anyone has other announcements to make, please enter something into the chat. We'll recognize you at the end of the lunch. Okay, so part one of this conversation, our local conversation, we have four speakers. We have Katie Stewart, who is going to kick off here in a moment. Many of you know her from her sitting on the 9R board and also work here for local Democrats. She'll talk about her own reproductive story at Mercy. Dr. Richard Grossman is a retired OBGYN who stays involved with reproductive issues and would like to weigh in on the local healthcare scene or lack thereof. Stephanie Aranales, the Consumer Assistance Program Director at CCHI Consumer Health Initiative, she'll talk about common issues like balance building and hospital discounted care, as well as touch on CCHI's legislative priorities. And then Greg Phillips is going to join us as well. He's a member of the League of Women Voters. He and his wife, Jan, is, they are in the process of creating the La Plata Healthcare Improvement Coalition. The coalition will bring together representatives from the county's various healthcare organizations, government, professional, employers, in a facilitated process designed to address issues with healthcare delivery in La Plata. Greg will be providing an overview of the group's mission, vision, and overall approach. Then we'll take Q&A from everybody for those four speakers, and then we'll move into the second part of our program. So a busy, busy day today, and um, we appreciate your being here. Thank you so much. First, Katie Stewart. Tell me, how are things going at Mercy from your point of view? <laughs> oh, um, well, thank you, Anne and the club for having me. Um, from my point of view, at least uh, from a reproductive care perspective, I'd say it's not going very well. Um, I don't really have a presentation to share so much as a personal story um, of, and I'll try to make it quick since we have a full docket here. Um, in 2016, um, I, well, actually it was, it was 2015, I um, became pregnant. It was a surprise, but my husband and I are like, all right, well, we already have a bunch, so what's one more to add? Um, I had experienced difficult pregnancies in the past, um, and this one was especially difficult. Um, I dealt with um, 
pregnancy induced hypertension. I had had preeclampsia in a previous pregnancy and I just was very much high risk. I was also 35, which is considered a geriatric pregnancy, which is depressing when you're 35, but there it is. Um, so I, I was seeing my OBGYN weekly um, just to monitor my health. And early on in the pregnancy, we had a conversation about how um, it was time for me to be done. And uh, she suggested I have a tubal ligation. And after a discussion with my husband, it was very much, um, you know, decided that that's, you know, we, we were done um, having children. And, and that was the best course of action was a tubal ligation. And it was easy for me well, I shouldn't say easy, but um, I had had C-sections previously and I was due to have another one with this, with this delivery. And uh, at the time, and this, I guess is not true anymore considering Mercy just stopped offering tubal ligations. I had to, my doctor had to write a letter and get permission from a priest to, uh, for me to have my tubes tied. Um, even though I had already had three children um, and I had had various health issues with all of my pregnancies, I needed permission from a priest to have this procedure done. Um, they did sign off on it after uh, my, my OB had made a very good argument that my health was it just, I was not able to, to carry any more children, nor did I want to. Um, and so I, I truly consider the tubal ligation, ligation that I got right after the birth of um, my almost seven-year-old um, life-saving because had I gotten pregnant again, it most likely would have been a choice between, um, you know, carrying that pregnancy to term or and dying as, you know, most likely dying from the complications or, you know, I having been raised Catholic, it was very much ingrained in me that abortion was not really an option, um, but it would have had to have been. And I'm really grateful that, that I had a procedure that, that didn't force me to, to make that choice, that I made that, that choice in conjunction with, with my doctor and my husband. And to think that this life-saving procedure um, is no longer available to um, those in our community that, that birth and have children is just mind boggling. I have a nine-year-old daughter and the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, six, almost seven years ago, I have more rights to my reproductive health than she does today. And, and that's, it's just ridiculous. And so, um, you know, I, my OB knew that I was pretty politically active. And when she got word of, of what Mercy was trying to do, she reached out to me um, to try to get, you know, the Herald involved and, and get um, some rallies going and making sure that those across our um, corner of the state knew what was happening. And so, uh, you know, big thanks to Four Corners OBGYN. And I know Dr. Grossman practiced there for many years. Um, for advocating for their patients at Mercy. So really that's my story is a tubal ligation all in all saved my life. And that it's life-saving healthcare and it should be accessible regardless of the hospital's religious affiliation because it's not my religious affiliation. So there you go. Well, Katie, thank you for that perspective. I'm not seeing questions and I'm sure people are having a hard time figuring out how to ask questions of you. Uh, it's such a personal story and it's so heartfelt. There was a great article in the Durango Herald um, about this that went on at even greater length about just how dire it is for so many women and so many men also in La Plata County who want to be responsible parents to the kids they already have or choose not to be a parent for health reasons or other reasons. And it's shocking that that seems to be the only um, provider that we have at this point. 
I'm not seeing any other questions yet. I'm going to move on to Dr. Dick Grossman right now, um, ask him to weigh in. And then if people come up with questions for Katie, for uh, Dick, for the later speakers, do just put them in. Let us know who's in specific there for. This isn't a forum, not the same question for everybody. You can ask individual questions as well, and we'll just keep on going. Thank you so much, Katie, for your story. Dr. Grossman, Dick Grossman, are you present and are you able to speak? Thank you so much. I am, and I'll do my best at uh, speaking. So, Katie, I'm sorry that you um, had the potential problem of not being able to have your tubes tied. I'm not sure how the Medical Morals Committee, as it used to be called, is now made up. I used to be on that, and uh, I was probably a thorn in the side of that committee because at one point I actually handed a package of pills, birth control pills, to one of the nuns who was on the committee. The rules of the game for um, Catholic hospitals really haven't changed, but in the past, most of the time that I was practicing at Mercy, the rules were bent in the favor of women. And I believe that also Mercy allowed vasectomies. They're done in private offices. So um, I wasn't aware of any man coming before the Medical Morals Committee to have his tubes tied. I advocate for vasectomy. It worked for me, and it's a lot easier procedure than doing a tubal ligation for a woman, except if her abdomen is already open, having a cesarean section. In that case, doing a tubal ligation or Removing the tubes in total, removing all the tubes to decrease the risk of, of ovarian cancer um, is just a five-minute procedure. You might be asking yourself, as I asked myself, what do you mean ovarian cancer starts in the tubes? But that's the latest theory, and it has lots of support. So, at least in theory, the only women who are now able to have tubal ligations at Mercy are women who are high risk because of a genetic mutation of having, uh, of developing ovarian cancer. I agree very much, Katie, that um, my rights as a human being should not be limited because of the place where um, I'm having my surgery. So thank you very much for explaining that. Uh, we have, I believe, as one of the Bill of Rights, um, the right to not have a state-determined religion, and yet, in this um, community, although it is possible to get a woman's, uh, for a woman to have her tubes tied at another hospital, um, to a large extent, reproductive care is determined by the Catholic Church in La Plata County. Fortunately, there is an alternative that is to go to ASH to have a tubal ligation. Unfortunately, if your abdomen is already open, it doesn't make any sense to me to have to wait until you're um, probably finished breastfeeding and until the C-section scar is healed, have a second general anesthetic and all the, the additional risk and um, the expense of going to another hospital. So um, I hope that we can find a way that will allow women to continue having their tubes tied or 
removed at the time of cesarean section. That's all of my presentation. I would be happy. And if you have any questions or anybody else um, to try to answer them. I have a question. And no, I didn't put it in the chat box, but I'm going to dive right in. Um, it's my understanding that vasectomies are now quite reversible. I know that 20 or 30 years ago, if a man had a vasectomy, it was far more questionable whether or not he would be able to change his mind and go ahead and procreate. What's the story now? There's a movement saying a woman can only get pregnant once a year. If that, a man can make a woman pregnant 300, 400, 500 times a year if he chooses. What about asking them to get vasectomies until they're at the place that they want to, to have a family? So I think is that feasible? I think I heard you say that a woman makes an egg only once a year. I think it's more. No, no, like, no, no. She can only carry one pregnancy a year. I'm sorry. Okay. She, she makes lots of eggs, way too many eggs. But she can only get pregnant realistically once a year versus a man can get a woman pregnant every day of every year or multiple times if he's lucky or she is. <laughs> So there are many egg, many sperm and very few eggs. And it makes a lot of sense to do a vasectomy. Um, it's about a 10 or 15 minute procedure. Unfortunately, the only doctor that I know who does vasectomies charges about $1,000 uh, to do that. Um, I've forgotten your original question, Nan. Reversible. Oh, are they reversible? Really? Thank you, Gay. Um, and then my understanding is that still the risks of the ability for a man to have uh, vasovasotomy, I think it's called, done and have it succeed are still only about 50 50. I think the risk has improved. However, um, unfortunately, it's not 100%. It's also possible for the man to have his sperm, his semen frozen and kept in case he wishes to um, start another pregnancy at a later time. That's expensive. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good to know. There's an interesting comment in the chat box from Barb. I'm concerned that high-risk OBGYN physicians will start preferring not to come to Durango now and in the future due to Mercy's Catholic control. Emergencies like ectopic, ectopic pregnancies could become a lawsuit risk. So I guess that's almost two points. Yeah. Would high-risk OBGYN physicians choose to work somewhere else? Maybe not Tennessee or Kentucky or Texas right now. Um, but, but and, and then secondly, what about ectopic pregnancies? Could that become a lawsuit risk? So I don't think ectopic pregnancies would become a lawsuit risk. I did an abortion in Mercy. Um, a woman who was pregnant with an IUD in place was septic. That She came in with a fever of 104. She would die if the pregnancy continued. I had no problems doing the procedure, nor any problems with the medical ethics committee after the procedure. That is covered by the American bishops. I hadn't thought about the possibility that we would have trouble recruiting new OBGYN docs. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that. There are many Catholic hospitals throughout the country, and. Um, many physicians who are not Roman Catholic work in those hospitals. So I think there is a lot of uh, competition to avoid. Um, there are a lot of places in the country where that would be a factor. And fortunately, abortion services don't need a hospital except for very rarely. And um, that is a service that's available at Planned Parenthood here in La Plata County. Okay, um, 
thank you for those comments. I don't see any additional questions in the chat, although I do see uh, quite a few comments back and forth. Uh, I think Katie's main point and your main point, Dick, is that AF, anima surgical, is capable certainly of doing vasectomies, excuse me, or tubules, but it is an added layer of cost, time, expense, and potential risk to the, the patient to move her from having already had a child to another hospital at a later date to then have a tubal. It just seems ridiculous. So um, well, there's one additional message. Let me just take a look. Uh, Jan Phillips, it appears that many medical students are not choosing to go into OBGYN specialty. Many hundreds of spots were left unfilled this year. So I think that's a good thing for us all to keep in mind. Um, nationwide, it's not a promising field. Anyway. So my hope is that the Supreme Court judges and their wives will have difficulty finding OBGYN care. Huh. Uh, and that will maybe change the the climate of the country in a little bit. The real risk comes not with a woman having her tubes tied or having an ectopic pregnancy, but there is a, a risk that is being discussed a lot. If a woman has a miscarriage that is later, um, it, do the police have to know about that? And um, in states that limit or prohibit abortion completely, that has been a serious concern. I'm hoping that the next couple of speakers um, can also address what, if anything, we can do with Centura to try to get them more responsive to the court of public opinion. Um, but let's find out. Dick, thank you so much for your time. Let's move on to the next speaker. Again, if a thought comes to you for a previous feature, speaker, just go ahead and throw it in the chat with the person you want it addressed to. I'd like to introduce Stephanie Arenales. Um, Stephanie, I said a couple of words about you before, but you're going to be talking about your work with the Colorado Consumer Health Initiative Consumer Assistance Program, common issues like balance billing and hospital discounted care. Why don't you go ahead and tell us um, a little bit more about yourself and your work? Thank you. I will. Um, I've got a presentation. May I share my screen? Certainly, uh, Gwyn is getting that organized. He's making you a co-host to do that. Got it. Thank you. So, can you see something with an agenda on it? Okay, great. So. Uh, First of all, thanks very much. I really appreciate the chance to come and speak to you all today. Um, I am a soon-to-be Durango resident. I kind of live there a half time now and I'll be moving down in the, in the summertime. So maybe I'll get to know some of you better. Um, as she mentioned, I'm, I'm with the Colorado Consumer Health Initiative and I'm the director of the consu our Consumer Assistance Program. Um, I've worked in uh, the eligibility and enrollment space for Medicaid and CHP Plus, as well as Connect for Health Colorado for about 20 years, um, done work around the EPSDT or benefits package for children in the Medicaid program, um, and uh, been on the board of a community health center and a dental clinic. Um, so um, those are my credentials or my bona fides as it were. Um, so as, uh, as she mentioned, I'm with the Colorado Consumer Health Initiative. We're a nonprofit statewide consumer advocacy organization working in the healthcare space. Um, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Here we go. So that's us. Our vision is around equitable access to affordable, quali high quality um, healthcare for all Coloradans. Um, we were created a little over 20 years ago as to be a counterweight to uh, the more powerful voices in the healthcare space and to re represent consumers. Uh, about five years ago, we started a consumer assistance program. Um, we as an organization were getting lots of inquiries from individuals about problems they were having with um, access to and paying for healthcare services and coverage. Um, and so in response to that, we created this CAP 
consumer assistance program. This was consumer assistance programs aren't new. Um, they were established as a part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, there was a federal grant um, made available to states. Unfortunately, Colorado did not take up that opportunity at the time. Um, and so we started ours at CCHI with uh, independently with grant funding. Um, and we've been funded continuously by the next 50 initiatives since we started and have had some sponsorships from a couple of community foundations um, over time. Um, in the consumer assistance program, we help individuals who are just you know, struggling with their medical bills um, and struggling with their insurance and maybe insurance isn't covering something or maybe somebody is uninsured. So we help people navigate that process. Um, by you know helping them with complaints to the and submit appeals or ex external reviews, um, we'll help people with complaints to the division of insurance. Uh, we'll help people call their providers or call their insurance carriers to get things sorted out. Um, and then we also are really mindful of trying to look at somebody's entire situation. So you know a medical bill is often the tip of the iceberg um, and, and can really throw a family or an individual into uh, a financial tailspin. So we'll try to look at other resources for people and do a screening and, and refer people to other programs they might be eligible for, like food assistance or WIC or um, energy assistance or what have you. Um, so I'm having a navigation issue. Um, and just to give you sort of a taste of the kinds of issues we handle, I mean, really, people come to us with bills that range from twenty dollars to over a million dollars, um, and it really there's no there's no sort of minimum bill um, that would be you know an entry requirement into the program. Um, it, it's it's whatever is of financial significance to somebody. Um, we'll help them. We'll help them deal with it. Um, you know, one case we had. Um, lately was somebody who was on vacation in Arizona, um, had a Colorado regulated plan. She had a significant health issue uh, and her bills ended up being around a million dollars. And her insurance carrier denied the claims because she was out of network at the time. Um, and so that was clearly a violation of um, Colorado's balance billing protections. And so we were able to get that claim paid. Um, you know, on the other side of the spectrum, as we hear from clients with, you know, smaller bills, maybe they got charged, um, a, they got charged for a primary, a preventive care service that they shouldn't have been charged for. Um, and so we were able to help them recover their copay um, for that visit. Um, so since we've been around, we've served 2,600 people across the state, including in the Florida County. Um, 47 counties in Colorado and, and have are verging on about $7 million in, in consumer savings. In La Plata in particular, we haven't had a lot of clients from La Plata, um, maybe about 30, um, and their issues have run the gamut from balance billing uh, to ambulance transports. Um, and so um, I, I would just take a minute to plug the program and, and, and encourage referrals. Um, and yes, I will be sharing contact information um, as well as how to get in touch with us or refer people to us. I've got that information at the end of the program, at the end of the slide deck. Um, but I did want to touch on two particular issues. I know um, balance, we've mentioned balance billing, but I'm gonna I'm gonna defer that one because uh, I think I want to talk more about hospital discounted care. And also what's happening with Medicaid. Um, there's been a lot of news. Medicaid's been in the news a lot lately, and I wanted to dispel some um, misconceptions that people might have about what's happening with Medicaid. So um, I'll start with hospital discounted care. Um, and, um, so a couple of years ago in, in 2021, there was some legislation passed. It was House Bill 1198. Um, and it really strengthened um, Protections consumers have, well, it, it strengthened the consumer protections in hospital financial assistance policies. Um, the Affordable Care Act um, implemented the requirement for non nonprofit hospitals to offer financial assistance to individuals, and we codified that in Colorado law back then. But it was never, the implementation was always sort of, oh, 
for lack of a better term, not terrific. Um, so a lot of people were not screened, and a lot of people were offered payment plans when they might have been eligible for it. And so in response to a lot of issues that we were seeing and complaints that we were getting um, and cases we were helping navigate, um, we partnered with another organization called the Colorado Center on Modern Policy to go for with, with this legislation, and it passed. And this strengthened program was implemented last year in September. Um, and so it really... Like I said, it strengthens consumer protections and it, it requires hospitals to screen uninsured patients for financial assistance. Um, it, that just has to happen. And that screening has to be provided in their preferred language. Um, and they people can apply for discounted care, um, even if it appears they might be eligible for Medicaid. Um, and it does things like limits the amount, amounts charged and it, it, well, it provides two layers of discounts. It discounts the initial charges, and then it limits the amount um, that people have to um, pay over time in a payment plan. And I have a lot of detail. Um, let's go to eligibility. So people are eligible up to 250% of the poverty level. So it's low and moderate income people. Um, people who are uninsured, as I mentioned, and people who are insured can qualify as well. They just have to ask. So that's a really important point. If you're uninsured, they are required to screen you. If you're insured, they're not. So insured patients really need to know to ask for that screening. Um, you have to be a Colorado resident to qualify, um, but you can have any immigration status in order to, um, you can't be barred from applying or being enrolled because you are undocumented or your you know legal permanent resident doesn't matter. Um, as I said, it it does provides discounts, um, and it applies to all medically necessary services, um, and, and it applies to um, provider fees. Uh, so if if the provider bills separately from the hospital, say the anesthesiologist or the emergency room physician those discounts apply to that provider as well, not just the hospital. Um, it also establishes protections from collections. So it prohibits a hospital from sending you to collections um, for 100, about 180 days or six months um, from the date of service. And there are noticing requirements um, and screening requirements. So those that screening uh, has to occur if you're eligible, the, the discounts have to be applied. Um, before somebody can be sent to collections. Um, and if somebody's already on a payment plan, they also have protections from collections. Um, if they, you know, they can miss up to three payments on their payment plan, um, the noticing is required. And a person can request to re, uh, like a review of their eligibility. So say your income changed since you were screened, they would have to rescreen you and reapply a discount based on current income. There are appeal rights, there are complaint rights, um, and I, and I want to, let's see, point to some additional information that we have posted on our website. So we've created a fact sheet, um, and I'll send this, I'll send this um, presentation, it's got the links embedded into it. There's a fact sheet that explains kind of a one pager to share. Um, we put it together in um, not just English, it's available in Spanish and Chinese and Vietnamese, and um, I can't remember the other language, um, but we've also created a patient and advocates guide, which is a lengthier, um, a lengthier document that really runs through the ins and outs of the program. Um, what to do, we're asking people to um, help us spread the word. We've got some um, um, kind of I'm losing my I'm losing my ability to think of this word. Um, anyway, some some information nuggets to share with people. Um, we're collecting client experience um, so that we can share that with the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. That's the agency that implements and regulates this program. Um, and we're spending a lot of time um, talking with patients about what's going on, helping patients navigate the process, and sharing information with the department. Um, and then here's where you can apply. So you can apply at the hospital uh, at Mercy and at the okay. Surgical Center. Both of those facilities are um, participate in this program. 
And I will take a breath and just ask if anybody has questions. Stephanie, a few questions have come in. One of them is, how have most clients found out about your services? Um, we do not do a ton of marketing uh, because we're a small program, but most people find us on the web. Um, we at CCHI, we have a web uh, a website. I think most people are looking for information around balance billing, um, and so they find us that way. Um, we do do some community presentations um, from time to time, and uh, like this one. Um, and I, and really, I'm trying to we're we're, we're trying to uh, maintain a balance between doing outreach and maintaining our capacity because we're a small team. And, and so while we want to help anybody that um, gets in contact with us, we do have kind of a limited capacity. Um, so it's uh, it's a it's kind of a delicate balance. In fact, we're waiting for another grant to come in so that we can hire somebody new at this point. So right now, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's okay. There are a couple more questions, but Gwen did comment. It's your understanding that you have limited resources and would actually like to find people in La Plata and other counties to get trained. And that's part of your reason for being here today. Is that correct? That is true. You know, we would, we do have, so we've got a staff of three and then we also have two volunteers that help us out and they have been instrumental in, in letting us grow the program. Like, like you mentioned, uh, the demand for our services has grown. I think we're Oh, over 30, we've seen, uh, I think our caseload has grown, you know, our monthly average last year was about 58 new cases a month. And now we're at this month in March, we had 100 new cases. So we're trying to manage, you know, manage capacity and demand. Um, and so we do, we do look for volunteers. Um, and I won't quite, they're, they're, we're looking for volunteers who won um, have some experience in the healthcare space. So they know something about um, reading explanation of benefits, know something about Medicaid, know something about how insurance works, are not intimidated by an appeal or a complaint to the division of insurance, for example. Um, and so, you know, our clients will just, we, we request, re request documents and sometimes they'll bring them in in a shopping bag. Um, and so we'll be sorting EOBs and bills and creating spreadsheets so that we can see, yeah, you owe this or you don't, or the coding looks weird. Um, let's follow up on this, that, or the other thing. You know, you got denied for whatever reason. And, and that's really you shouldn't have been denied because um, it's, it's so. Good. So, what you're saying is that you would love to have more volunteers, staff training uh, allowed, but it's not just anyone, it's somebody with a little bit of background. And the ability to yeah. exactly. grasp it all. Yeah, it's There's a, another um, question. Yeah, go ahead. There's another question here, and I'm I am kind of rushing you along a little bit because we do have two more speakers after oh, this. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Um, I can talk all day. Uh, what is your perspective on a recent federal case to exclude free screenings for heart, cancer, and STDs, et cetera, required under the ACA that insurance companies are now fighting to exclude? It. We all anticipate it will be escalated to the Supreme Court. Do you have a, a thought on that? I'm very, I mean, I can't say, organizationally, we haven't come together with um, a statement on that. So I'll tell you personally that I'm concerned. Uh, you know, we've been waiting for this to see what happens with the, this decision for quite some time and, um, you know, absolutely have concerns about, um, about limiting, um, you know, the scope and not requiring coverage for those services. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah. that the, it's a, I know that the state agencies are, are coming together, you know, coming together with what their next steps, but I couldn't tell you what they are at this point. Okay, good, thank you for that. There, um, Greg Phillips has asked a specific question to you um, about have you connected with Doug McCarthy from Local First here in Durango, and maybe you and and um, and Greg Phillips can have a side conversation. Although, yeah. although Greg is actually going to be the next speaker, so maybe you guys can exchange information. If you could put your details up in the chat, I think we are going to have to move along to Greg and Jan at this point. 
but we sure appreciate it. I'm delighted to hear about this program. I actually have one other quick question. Um, I know that part of your work is is limited by financial people in more financial need. Do you also offer free consultations or consultations on billing issues to others if they don't need significant assistance? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. and I'll just, I want to mention that we don't charge for our services. Um, so it's it's anybody who wants to call us and ask. Um, we can. Okay. Help them. I I would say that we don't do a lot of work around quality of care issues. That's kind of that's out of our scope. We're limited in what we can do for cases and collections. We can give some guidance, but we're not attorneys. Um, so we can do, you know, we can do a little bit. Um, and I would be, uh, would love to share this presentation with everybody. So I'll send that along to you. And if I could just take 30 seconds to address something that's been in the news um, a lot lately, and I've been hearing a lot of concern about it, is that, um, you know, during the public health emergency, everybody who was enrolled in Medicaid got locked in. Um, and so it's been three years people have been locked into Medicaid and you've probably seen in the news that everybody's gonna drop off Medicaid. Um, and that's not, that is, it is true that people who are on Medicaid will be renewed for their Medicaid coverage. That, that renewal process was suspended during the public health emergency, but it is not true that everybody's gonna lose Medicaid tomorrow. Um, so everybody's gonna go through a renewal process, um, and it will take, uh, it will happen over the course of the next year. Um, so if somebody had a renewal date in June, they will renew in June. If it was in November, it will be in November. So everybody's gonna go through a process um, to see if they're still eligible. And if they are still eligible, they'll remain enrolled in Medicaid. If they're not, there are other options. It opens up a special enrollment period, for example, through Connect for Health Colorado, so people can go over to the marketplace and enroll in a plan that way. Um, so I just wanted to address that because uh, I think there's uh, some some misinformation out there. Some anxiety. That's wonderful. I really appreciate that. That's really helpful to know, Stephanie. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, Again, what I'm going to do is move this along to the next speaker. If you could put your contact details in the chat box, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I don't know if you have plans, but if you can stick around in case we have a bit of extra time, then sure. we would love to, to toss it back over to you. Thank you for, for your presentation. Good yeah. luck with your work. That sounds great. Thanks. Our next speaker. I'm sorry. What? Okay. Very good. Our next speaker then is Greg Phillips. He is a member of the local League of Women Voters, yay. He's with the Health Care Committee there. Together with his wife, Jan, he's in the process of creating the Healthcare Improvement Coalition here in La Plata County. What is that all about, Greg? And tell us what your goal is there. Thank you, appreciate the time. Um, well, the La Plata Healthcare Improvement uh, coalition or ELFIC as we're we're calling it is, is something that's uh, evolved out of a pretty lengthy process. The League of Women Voters uh, Healthcare Committee uh, put together a survey uh, last summer through the fall, and the goal of that was to uh, gather uh, input from the community on their uh, experiences dealing with healthcare in La Plata County. Um, we had uh, about 546 responses. Um, and we summarized the data. And as you would suspect, you know, there were a lot of frustrations with various aspects, not, not all totally frustrated. There were a lot of positives, but, but in general, people were frustrated with, with insurance and billing and, and, uh, the affordability, uh, availability, you know, there were, um, uh, some real specific heart wrenching stories about, you know, people's experiences, um, and so we uh, we gathered all that data together, and uh, and we uh, formed a collaboration with uh, Leanne Jolin from uh, San Juan Basin Health, uh, Doug McCarthy from Local First Foundation, and um, Bill um, Wilson and Rickel Block from the Durangos for Improved Healthcare. And all of these groups were involved in various aspects of of healthcare delivery, but looking at looking at it from different through different lenses. And, and we, we formed a core group and began meeting and over the course of several months came up with this concept of recognizing that there are some identified issues in our community, not just from a patient experience, but um, 
uh, you know, there's some shortages uh, or some gaps in types of care where we're missing out on certain specialties. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's issues with, with insurance and you know, our provider left town, uh, one major provider, Bright Health left. Um, so it, a lot of these groups were looking at it from different perspectives, as well as Mercy doing their community health assessment and, uh, um, and uh, San Juan Basin doing their five-year assessment. So we, we decided that it might be worth exploring, creating a coalition where we could bring people together, have these organizations that are each working essentially often in silos and get them all at the table where they could uh, collaborate and look at the issues and see if we could, in a constructive, impartial way, um, facilitate a process. So we, you know, we came up with this idea. Uh, we wrote up a, a pretty detailed proposal uh, outlining uh, you know, the structure and organization and the objectives of this, this group. Um, and we got the League of Women Voters to uh, agree to be the lead agency for this. And uh, we thought it was appropriate for the league to do it because this we're, we're not creating an organization, we're creating a process. So there, there's no particular um, uh, outcome that we're looking at or a particular policy, I should say. You know, we're, the purpose of the coalition isn't to force somebody to do something that they don't want to do. The purpose is to get people to come to the table, work together, share what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to do and see if we can come up with some constructive solutions uh, locally. Now, we're not looking to fix national health care. That's, that's clearly not on the agenda, but there's things that we can do. So the, in terms of the structure, um, we've, we've kind of created these uh, buckets or work groups, uh, each with a specific focus that uh, members of the coalition will uh, will choose which ones they want to participate in. And I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown of what those are. One is affordability. Uh, we've got one for provider availability, service availability, uh, accessibility, things dealing with barriers to healthcare. Uh, we've got a, a, a community benefit group that will look at how the nonprofits are uh, contributing to a community benefit effort. Um, there'll be a healthcare data group. And then finally, a legislative and policy group. Um, each of these groups will be facilitated by a professional facilitator, and we've we've hired uh, some some top facilitators in our community: um, uh, Sandia Atkinson, Rachel Turiel, uh, Mark Mastalski, Kathy Cowles, Mike Karpfen, Karen Thompson, Claire Rains have all agreed to be facilitators. Uh, we've also have put together an advisory council of folks that are kind of helping to lend support to this uh, effort. We've got Terry Bacon, Rob Crane. Uh, Laura Lewis Marchino, Martha Minot, Lee Meggs, Kathleen McGinnis, Lori Meininger, and Joe Murphy, Dr. Joe, um, have all agreed to be on our advisory council. Uh, we floated this, this proposal now out to the community and gotten a lot of feedback on it. A lot of it's gone through a lot of iterations and, and refining. And uh, we basically have got it pretty locked down to where we want to go. And we've been uh, reaching out and inviting members. We've had um, uh, a number of folks have already agreed to participate. Others that have, have uh, indicated willingness to participate, including um, Mercy, Axis, uh, Anima Surgical Hospital, uh, La Plata County, uh, the city of Durango. Uh, we're talking to 9R. Uh, we're talking to the town of Bayfield, town of Ignacio. Uh, so we, we've got a, a pretty representative list of uh, of healthcare organizations, governments, uh, schools, uh, individuals, uh, large employers. Um, so the, again, a very impartial, open, facilitated process. We've uh, we're going to be doing what we're calling not what we're calling what's uh, referred to as a consent-driven decision-making process. So in this, all of the facilitators will be following um, the same facilitation methodology. Uh, in which essentially everybody in a in a work group, if they come up with a proposal, they have to work together to um, establish something that they can all tolerate and work with and agree to. Um, the the uh, work groups will also have a a volunteer role or a student intern role, and and we've created this with the intention of having somebody who will be participating in the work group discussions, taking minutes. Uh, being a resource to do some additional outside research and presentations. Uh, we've reached out to the fort, you know, in, in terms of getting some um, 
uh, for those students to participate in the summer internship and um, as well as uh, to the high schools. Um, and we've we've uh, reached out uh, to the community and we're continuing to find some volunteers. So we'll basically end up with hopefully seven of those folks or maybe less if some decide to do more than one. Um, our timeline for the project is uh, we're hoping to get everybody lined up with all of uh, the membership uh, commitments that we've asked for um, in the coming two months. And our goal is to have a kickoff meeting uh, in the first of June where we'll all gather together and meet and see what we can come up with. We've got ideas for the types of things that could eventually flow out of this, but um, we're, we're being uh, uh, neutral and uh, hoping to encourage the discussion and you know, bring ideas to the table that people can, can look at and decide. Happy to answer any questions. Yes. And, and if there's yes. folks, folks there that are interested in helping, this has been a, a heavy lift and uh, Jan and I have been, working our tails off, trying to get all this going. Uh, we're hoping to get some funding from the league to cover the cost of uh, the professional facilitators. We think that we might actually end up needing to come up with a few more dollars to, to, uh, to supplement what the league will be willing to do. But um, so any help with uh, being a participant or a volunteer or uh, helping contribute to some funds would be greatly appreciated. That's great. Um, if you would be sure to put your details in the chat box as well so people can reach out to you. I actually came up with a, a couple of questions. One of them was about your timeline, which you've already addressed. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so you're hoping to kick this off really in June for public input, I assume. And do you have a time frame for how long your information gathering is going to be? We do. Thank you. Hopefully. Um, so so the, the goal really is for this entity, not entity, this, this process, uh, we've set a term of 12 to 15 months. Uh, what we realistically expect is that we will, um, these work groups will form, they will, each work group will designate its own chair, each work group will designate its own agenda um, and uh, meeting schedule. And each of the, the chairs of the work groups will be part of a steering committee so that we'll have some cross-pollination and some collaboration between groups. We expect that during uh, January, sorry, excuse me, June through the end of August, there'll be the uh, probably monthly meetings of the work groups. Uh, and then, you know, depending on how it all goes, we hope that we'll have some good action items to, that these groups can be working on themselves and um, that there'll be less requirement for as frequent meetings, you know, thereafter. Good, good. That it'd be really interesting to see what you come up with. I'm not seeing specific questions in the chat box. Um, so at the moment, I do see you have just put in your website, which is good. And I assume they can get in contact with you or with Jan or other folks through that. That yeah, sounds the, good, either to the, volunteer the web, or to help. Okay. Yep. The website has you know an overview of the process, the timeline, the, the, uh, the folks involved. It's got applications for the volunteer or internship positions. It's got an application for the membership. Um, right now, we're structuring this um, as an invite only. It's not open to the public to just join in. Um, uh, we intend as part of our role is to make this a very transparent process. So we will be reporting to the community uh, through various channels what's going on and you know what, what uh, items have come up and who's participating and you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's really great. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for doing that. Thanks for, Thank you. gosh, embracing such a big challenge and really working on it. I'm personally dying to know some of your findings, like what are the what are the real areas of care missing and desperate for La Plata County? But, um, but I'm sure more information will come out of that. With and your and, neutral and you can see of all of it. We've put links to some of those assessments on the website, so you oh, can good. you can review. Okay. That. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. We sure appreciate it, Greg, very much. My pleasure. Okay. I have not been seeing in the chat box questions for any of the original four speakers. Um, we are going to move, as I said, this is a very long program today. We're going to move now to Gwyn Unger, um, who not only has been very involved with the Democrats and with the club, you've seen him at many, many, I think, all of these meetings. But he also now is 
the president of Colorado Healthcare Coalition, a local nonprofit organization which advocates for universal healthcare specifically. He has a presentation on that. He will screen share that presentation, I'm sure. Uh, by the way, Donald J. Trump has been pleading not guilty on 34 counts. Hmm. Just a quick little news update. Oh, oh. Um, and somebody else mentioned I was involved at the start of the movement to improve healthcare in La Plata County, as was Buzz Bricka. This is uh, Dick Grossman. No physician was currently working at Mercy was willing to join because of the fear they would be fired. And I think that's something you're probably going to be hearing a lot about, Greg, is um, the interesting uh, relationship physicians are having with Mercy right now. Anyway, thank you for your time. Mr. Unger, what are the chances of universal health care here in Colorado? Please tell us about it. All right, let's talk about that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here if I can make this work. Um, it's always a little bit of a challenge on PowerPoint. Can you see my screen now? Healthcare going forward? Yes, I can. I assume okay. everybody else can as well. Okay, so this, this is about a 15 minute presentation. I'll try to go through it a little bit quickly. I've got to put my screen down a little bit so I'll disappear from the picture so I can see the entire screen. Um, so about a year ago, we formed the Colorado Healthcare Coalition, um, and we are advocates for universal health care. You can see my email address there and my phone number. Be glad to talk to anybody uh, about this, and there's the website address. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I think is important is <clears throat> that, let me, let me back up just a second here. I, I mean, I have nothing but <clears throat> praise for all the people that are working on all the problems that our healthcare system has. But at the same time, <clears throat> you know, it, nothing that we're doing is actually resulting in covering everybody uh, so that everybody can get the healthcare that they need, regardless of how much money they have. So <clears throat> we're advocating for a universal healthcare system that would, in fact, cover everybody. So let's talk about that. And so I would ask the question how many of you would consider yourselves to be financially responsible? And my guess is that probably everybody on this call considers themselves to be financially responsible. Now, they say you shouldn't read your slides, but I'm going to read the next one. If you consider yourself to be financially responsible, shouldn't you be outraged at the fact that we waste two trillion dollars? That's two thousand billion dollars each year by spending twice as much per person for health care as other developed countries. And we don't get better health care. Now let's, let's talk about $2 trillion for a second. That, I mean, you kind of throw these numbers out there and you say, well, what does that really mean? Well, that's roughly two and a half times the defense budget. I've had people in the past tell me, oh, you know, if we just cut back the defense budget, we could cover health care for everybody. <clears throat> Not even remotely the case because we actually spend about $4 trillion every year on health care, five times the defense budget and we don't get better health care. So it strikes me that everybody ought to be saying, man, think what we could do with it, that $2 trillion that we're wasting right now. <clears throat> so the other thing I would say is don't just accept what I'm saying here. You can easily go out and Google all of this information that I'm going to tell you, and you can look it up. You don't have to, you don't have to believe me. So what are the problems with our current health care system? Well, it's incredibly expensive. As we just mentioned, we're wasting $2 trillion every year by spending twice as much as other countries. In 2021, roughly 30 million people didn't have any health insurance. 43% <clears throat> um, of working age adults were inadequately insured in 2022. This is that situation where they have insurance, but they can't afford the deductible. <clears throat> uh, my wife's deductible is either $8,000 or $8,500 this year on the exchange. So if something were to happen where she you know, got expensive medical care, we'd have to pay the $8,000 before the insurance would kick in and start paying anything. And that's the situation that a lot of people have where they, I mean, you can imagine, I think the average household has trouble coming up with $500 for an emergency. <clears throat> so to come up with a large deductible becomes really difficult. Um, 
And I think this number is probably pretty conservative. There were about 250,000 personal bankruptcies in 2022 caused primarily by medical debt. So that's people losing everything that they have because they got sick or hurt. And we pay two to 10 times as much for pharmaceuticals as other countries. If I had a little more time, I'd talk about uh, <clears throat> insulin. Uh, the fact that you know we pay about 10 times as much for insulin. And there've been some, some changes in that here recently, but uh, <clears throat> the, the, well, I'll, I'll keep going. Cancer treatment costs can result in significant debt that lasts long after treatment is ended, even for those with insurance. And again, the estimates are that if you get cancer, your chances of spending every penny you have are about 50%, regardless of whether you have insurance or not. Hmm. You can see these problems that we're having. Um, and we do not get better health care than people in other developed countries. And the primary source for this is the Commonwealth Fund. They do a survey every couple of years, and they rank uh, 11 developed countries in terms of healthcare outcomes. And from 2021, which is the last one I could find, the top performing countries overall, you can see Norway, the Netherlands, Australia, and we ranked last. <laughs> and we've ranked last in every survey for the past couple of decades. And so <clears throat> the only thing that we do particularly well on, we would come in second on measures of care process. I wasn't even sure what that was. I looked it up. It basically is the administrative side of it. So, you know, the ability to move somebody from one doctor to another doctor and that sort of thing. But in terms of actual healthcare outcomes, again, we rank last out of those 11. So it's clear we're not getting better healthcare than these other countries that spend a fraction of what we spend. This, I think, is an interesting graph. If you look at it's the percentage of healthcare spending as a percentage of the GDP. So GDP is gross domestic product. That's everything that we produce in a year. And you can see back in 1980, way on the left side of the graph, we were at the top end of the other countries that are shown here, but not you know, a great deal above them. And you can see way over on the right side in 2019, we're spending about 16% of GDP. I think that's actually a little low compared to the other countries that have gone from, you know, five to seven or eight to 10 <clears throat> kind of numbers. And so you can see why our, our healthcare is getting to be such a burden, just paying for it, because we're spending a huge amount of money every year. And again, not getting better outcomes. So why? <clears throat> I think this statement is absolutely correct. Our healthcare system is designed to make billions of dollars in profits for large companies it's not designed to provide healthcare to all who need it. And that's much different than those other countries. The healthcare systems of those other countries are designed to make sure that people get the healthcare they need, not to have massive profits uh, for different companies. Um, some healthcare executives make tens of millions of dollars each year, Co large corporations making billions of dollars, and they're absolutely opposed to making changes in the healthcare system. And they're perfectly willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying to keep the current system. I know in one of the presentations I did, I, I made the, the point that one of the healthcare executives, one of the CEOs was making over $100,000, not $100,000 a year, $100,000 a day, 365 days a year. When I first and when I first saw that, I thought, man, I did something wrong. I couldn't, that can't possibly be right. But it was in fact right, making well over $100,000 each and every day. So <clears throat> the thing that we've looked at here is single payer. And <clears throat> we ask, is that the only option if we want universal health care in the US? And the answer is no, that's not the only option, but it probably makes the most sense. So the, typically what you find is government-run uh, health care, where the government owns the hospitals, hires the doctors, all that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Great Britain is an example of that. Um, there are Some of the European countries have very heavily regulated private insurance to where the companies <clears throat> have to compete for customers through customer service. And then there's single-payer. Well, let's, we'll talk a little bit about that. So what is a single-payer health care system? <clears throat> Single payer means there's one entity that pays for the healthcare, okay? Typically a government entity. And so they take over all the payment functions. They collect taxes or premiums or whatever it is. And when somebody needs medical care, the government pays for it. But the healthcare continues to be delivered by the same mostly private entities. 
So the doctors and the hospitals and, and nurses and uh, technicians and so on that are providing services continue to provide the services in the same way, but the government ends up paying for it instead of a, a private health insurance company. And in single payer, true single payer, doctors and patients make healthcare decisions, not insurance companies. And the government collects funds and pays for healthcare. So who would be opposed to a single payer universal healthcare system? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. The people on the companies that are making these huge profits are going to oppose making these changes. And the most prominent special interest would be health insurance companies. That makes sense. They, under single payer, they pretty much go out of business. Pharmaceutical companies who would have to negotiate drug prices under single payer and large hospital chains. The, the largest sums of money that we spend for healthcare go to hospitals, not doctors. We figure doctors get somewhere around six to 8% of the money that's spent for healthcare and hospitals are more up in the 40% sort of range. So you can see why these special interests are gonna be against this. And so the question then comes up, what are they going to say about single payer if this comes to a vote again? <clears throat> They're going to say something like, you don't want socialized medicine, do you? And the answer to that is single payer is not socialized medicine. Socialized medicine means the government runs the healthcare system. In a single payer system, the government just takes care of paying healthcare bills and doctors and patients make healthcare decisions. And we have examples of doctors from Canada saying the government doesn't tell them what to do. <clears throat> they do what they need to do for their patients and the government just pays the bills. So the next thing that I, I hear from people is private companies are always more efficient than the government. Any, anytime there's a sentence that has always in it, you gotta be a little bit concerned about you know, whether that's really true. <clears throat> Perhaps when it comes to making a profit, this is true, but private health insurance companies spend 18 to 20% of every dollar on administration and profit. So that means out of every dollar, they're spending about 80 cents or 81 cents on actually paying for healthcare. Medicare, which is of course a government program, on the other hand, spends only two to 3% on administration and certainly nothing on profit. So 97 to 98 cents out of every dollar they spend goes to actually paying for healthcare. So which of those is more efficient? <clears throat> I'll leave it up to you to decide. Um, we sometimes hear people say we can't be certain that single payer would work in the US. And the answer I would have to that is our closest neighbor, Canada has had single payer for over 60 years. It works well, Canadians support it. And we're not that different from Canada. There's no reason at all to suggest that a single payer system would not work here. <clears throat> so again, they say there's not enough public support for a US single payer system. And I would say, well, you know, that might be because of all the lobbying that's done by the special interests. In any case, the chances of establishing universal health care at the federal level are quite low at the current time. And that's why we're looking at a single payer system for the state of Colorado. <clears throat> so another thing that you hear is a single state, single payer system would not be efficient. And it's clear it would not be as efficient as a federal system but a study by the Colorado School of Public Health, which was released a couple of years ago, showed that we would save, Coloradans would save between one and $4 billion with the Colorado single payer system. And that system would cover every resident of Colorado. And we still save <clears throat> billions of dollars. Another one you sometimes hear is all the doctors will quit because they won't get paid enough. And I would say, you know, it's kind of kind of stupid to think that we would create a system to provide health care for everybody and then pay the doctors so little that they all decide to quit. Uh, in any case, the, again, that report from the School of Public Health showed that we could save a billion dollars, even if we paid 250% of Medicare rates. And <clears throat> one of the things that really goes away under a single payer system is all these administrative costs that providers have to deal with in order to work with all these different insurance companies. So the doctors, uh, <clears throat> And, and other providers would still get paid uh, fair uh, compensation. So why would we want a single state system? Those of us at the Colorado Healthcare Coalition, you know, we, we would prefer a federal single payer system, but we know that under the current circumstances, there is no way in the world that's gonna happen. Um, <clears throat> and what we, there, there's also efforts going on in other states, Oregon, Washington, California, New York, to try to do single payer systems there. 
And we think that if we were to implement that, um, we would expect that you know the, those states would show that it works and the pressure for a federal system would become irresistible. And that's how it happened in Canada, by the way. It started in the province of Saskatchewan. The other provinces started looking at what was going on there saying, well, you know, we should do that too. And eventually it became a combination of province and, and federal single payer system. So what's the next step? <clears throat> and this is where the where I really want you to, to help out. So there's a bill in the, right now in the Colorado legislature, HB 23-1209, called Analyze Statewide Publicly Financed Healthcare. <clears throat> um, it will uh, direct the Colorado School of Public Health to do a detailed analysis of the feasibility of creating a single payer system in Colorado, including how to finance the system, the impact on the workforce, and it's designed to provide the information needed to craft a single payer system that will work well for all Coloradans. <clears throat> so at the status of the bill right now is it has passed the Health and Insurance Committee in the House. I went to Denver a couple of weeks ago and testified in front of that committee. It's now at the Appropriations Committee uh, in the House, so there's a price tag that has to be put on it. It will then go to the House, and we feel quite confident that it will pass the House. <clears throat> Obviously, if that happens, then it goes to the Senate. So the, it's not quite as sure that it will be able to pass the Senate. So what we're asking you to do is ask your senator to support this bill. For, so for those of us in Plata County, it's Cleve Simpson, I've talked to him a couple of times about this and emailed him several times. And we really would like to see uh, as many people as possible contacting Senator Simpson and asking him to support House Bill 1209. Um, again, the whole idea here is to get the information that we need in order to be able to put together a system that would work well. Um, Next steps, you can donate to the Colorado Healthcare Coalition. That's our coalition or to other nonprofit advocates for universal health care. It's going to cost a lot of money to get the truth to the citizens of Colorado and <clears throat> get involved. If you're interested in, in working with us, um, we would be more than happy to, to have you on our side. Um, I'm going to play, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to play a little short video here for you. Um, <clears throat> if I can make this work. Okay, I'm gonna try to share this with sound so that you'll be able to hear it. Okay, can you see the uh, rainbow there? You good on that? Okay. Yes, we can see it. I'd like to ask you a question. Can you imagine an efficient, equitable and comprehensive universal health care system in Colorado. Can you imagine all Colorado residents being covered? Can you imagine receiving comprehensive medically appropriate care including dental, vision, hearing and mental health care? Can you imagine receiving home care and long-term care? Can you imagine being free to make health care decisions with your health care providers? Can you imagine being free to choose your qualified health care providers? Can you imagine funding this system by paying premiums based on your ability to pay? Can you imagine being free from deductibles, co-pays, and medical debt? Can you imagine benefiting from fair drug and hospital prices and having health care providers receive fair payment? Can you imagine being free from middlemen with the incentives and power to limit benefits or impose other barriers to your care. Can you imagine gaining this kind of freedom from simply changing the messed up way we pay for health care? I can. I, I can. can. So part of, <clears throat> part of what we're doing um, as the Colorado Healthcare Coalition is making videos <clears throat> and putting them onto social media. Um, and it's it's an interesting <laughs> sort of thing that we're doing. I, that that the idea for that came from Virginia Gephardt, who has been working with us. She's been working with the Colorado Foundation for Universal Healthcare too uh, for many years. And 
you know, it's, it's just that, that kind of, can this really happen? And we think it can. Um, <clears throat> there, the, the points that were covered in that Can You Imagine video are part of a 10 point thing that's in the, in the legislation says, whatever they come up with has to have these things. <clears throat> and so it's, it's not trying to specify, the, the bill's just asking for the study. But then the Colorado School of Public Health is told, you need to focus on these 10 things that we think are absolutely important. There's also going to be a task force that will advise uh, the School of Public Health, and there'll be, they'll be meeting with various constituencies around the state. This is not intended to just focus on the people who are uh, universal health care advocates. They're going to listen to the hospitals and the medical associations and you know all the different groups that want to talk about this so that we can come up with something that really makes sense. So again, right now, <clears throat> the biggest thing we'd like you to do is to contact Cleve Simpson, our Senator, and tell him to support HB 23-1209 when it gets to the Senate. So I think that's pretty much what I've got. I'd be glad to answer questions if there are any. There are a few questions, uh, Gwen. That was a really nice presentation. So Cleve, of course, is also the Senator from Montezuma County as well as Archuleta, et cetera. Um, and you're thinking that Cleve is really the one to lean on at this point. Barbara is pretty much in agreement that the study should proceed. Okay, <clears throat> I've gone ahead. We've thrown some uh, email details for Cleve in the chat box, as well as a phone number for him, as well as the bill number. Uh, and I think I've got all that correct. One question, under what category does Medicare fall? So the, those are the kinds of questions that we get asked. <clears throat> and the purpose of the study is to answer that question. Okay. So, I mean, there's a couple of different ways you could do Medicare. You could just leave it alone and say, okay, everybody over 65, you're in Medicare and you're not part of Colorado mm -hmm. Care or whatever. Or we could ask the federal government to give us the Medicare funds mm -hmm. and then include people <clears throat> over 65 in the program. So again, the, the purpose of the bill here is to ask the School of Public Health to answer those kinds of questions. Good, good to know. The next question is from Jan Phillips. It's about the Chambers of Commerce. They are often against single payer federally state level. Uh, most insurance companies may lose most healthcare, but not all. Most countries with single payer mention that insurers broaden their offerings and are doing better. Are there other reasons you think the chamber is against single payer? Many businesses are struggling to offer employees health benefits. What's, what's, where's the holdup? So I think there's a couple of things. I mean, that's something we've pondered because there are a lot of chambers of commerce that are supposed to represent the businesses in their area, but don't seem to be doing that. And there's, there's no question that, you know, for like for a small business where you can't afford to have an employer health plan right now, that puts you at a big disadvantage in terms of trying to recruit employees because the average employee needs to have some sort of health insurance. And you know, with the system we have now, that means they end up on the uh, exchange paying 100% of the premium themselves. Well, if you had universal coverage, then everybody would be covered and the, the businesses could stop worrying about that. Even the big businesses that spend huge amounts of money every year trying to deal with insurance would start saving that money because again, that wouldn't be an issue. <clears throat> um, so I, I think that we need to, to reach out to the chambers and to, to the individual members of the chambers of commerce to say, this would be a huge advantage for you. It's not something that adds more regulation or something. It, it actually takes away a lot of the headaches that businesses have now. That's great. Um I'm not, I see several MDs and uh, healthcare providers on this call. And I'm curious if they have specific questions about what they would like to see in the study or their concerns about moving to this kind of a single payer system. Um, I've also asked Kirby or um, the, the actual title of this, Gwen, is it's a study for, it's HB 23-1209, I put in the chat, but is there any additional information about the name of it again that we should reference? So I, I would just 
if you if you Google HB 23-1209 Colorado, <clears throat> it'll bring the bill up. It's not a huge long bill. It's uh, you know fairly short, but it's got those those points in it. It talks about the advisory group and so on and so forth. Um, so you know you can get all the details about the bill just by bringing it up and spending five minutes reading it. <clears throat> I think Buzz has his hand up. Great, Buzz. And and let me ask you, what's the time frame for this? When are you expecting this to come before the, the Senate? Well, the the session is is coming to a close here before too long, so it's got to move to the Senate pretty quickly here. Um, I think it'll clear the House quickly. I don't know what why the Appropriations Committee has taken quite as long as they are with it. It's been a couple of weeks uh, since it was passed in the committee by an eight to two vote, incidentally. Yes. Okay. Buzz, did you have a question? Yes. I have a comment, and I think it, it is germane. Um, it, many people in the United States, when you talk about other systems in other countries, they say, well, I have friends in Canada and they hate their healthcare system. And in Europe, they hate their healthcare system. English don't like it. That's baloney. That's a lot of uh, immigrants, people who wanted to make more money in Canada or in England. Um, and that they came to the States because it was much more lucrative here. They uh, have very open ears in um, um, uh, insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies. And so they, they say that that's the common uh, feeling in those countries. I've spent a fair amount of time in Canada. And in general, the Canadians give their healthcare system a far better rating than the public does in the United States. And that's true in many other countries, but we have a, such a biased um, perception of healthcare in those countries um, that people say, well, no, 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 we don't wanna be like that. It's terrible, it's not. Yeah, somebody asked me, you know, why do so many Canadians come to the U.S. for healthcare? So I did a little investigation. There's about 32 million people in Canada. About 32,000 come here, so that's a tenth of one percent of the population that's coming here. And you ask, okay, who's paying for that? Well, clearly, the patient's going to be paying for it. So that means only people who have a lot of money can afford to come here and pay our extreme prices. And some of them may choose to do that for whatever reason. Maybe they go and want to go to the Mayo Clinic or something and get the best in the world or whatever it is. But it's a very tiny percentage. And I worked with some Canadians about seven or eight years ago. And, you know, we started talking about our system and they, they look at us like, are you people crazy? <clears throat> you know, it's, it's night and day difference. Yep. Thanks, Buzz. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I have to say, I um, just speaking from personal experience, I just walked out of uh, three days in the hospital with a forty thousand dollar bill, and so I blew through my out of pocket. But they're saying, oh, you know, one of the doctors I worked with on the floor who happened to show up at my bedstock said was out of po was uh, out of network, and therefore I should be charged ten or twelve thousand dollars for the privilege of having him attend me instead of the guy I thought was my attendant. So it is really crazy. Okay. Um, Kirby thinks that the cost of this bill would be 200 to $300,000 or so for a study, which certainly seems reasonable to save us all a bunch of money. Um, yeah. when, when the 1176 <laughs> report was done, which the one that's the one that said we would save money by going to single payer, they only uh, appropriate $100,000 for that. And the people at the School of Public Health said, you know, that's not really enough to be able to do a detailed study. So we think that the Appropriations, appropriations Committee is going to probably uh, allow <clears throat> $270,000 or something for this study, which, you know, in when you start comparing it to the $2 trillion we're wasting, <clears throat> you know, it gets lost in the, you know, the round off. Yeah, chump change, chump change. That was a really interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks for having worked with with everybody else here to really hone it down and make it so accessible. Um, Stephanie has chimed in saying, again, balance billing regulations with state or federal do protect you. Oh, do protect me from those out of network dark charges. I may be in touch with you. That's why I was asking about whether it's just really low income people who can do that. Um, we have gone ahead and we put Cleve Simpson's phone number and email in here. We put the bill reference number in here. We've also put a bunch of uh, details further up about the website, uh, et cetera, for this group in case you need additional information. I'm going to go ahead and see if, oh, of course, my copy and paste doesn't work because I'd gone to a different message. Let me go ahead and put that information right in one more time while we're talking. And uh, I think that's about it for this conversation. 
Gwen, great job. Great job to all of the speakers. Thank you for really a thoughtful presentation today. We would like to give a virtual round of applause to all and encourage the viewers of this to please get in touch with our legislators. We have something we can actually do to make a difference. Let's go ahead and move on that quickly. Um, the next announcement would be the club will be holding a meeting on May 2 for the LPEA elections coming up. As much to look at the candidates running, but also what LPEA do, it will be doing for the next year or so to, to really improve ever more on the commitment by Tri-State and by local providers to our renewables future. We are looking for speakers moving forward and we are looking to do this in person. And we're looking at potentially doing a brown bag lunch outside so that we can keep it affordable for people rather than going to the Doubletree, which doesn't really want our business in the summertime based on their pricing. Um, if you have any ideas, please let us know. We're looking for them. If you'd like to join our group, we don't meet a lot uh, to discuss speakers, but we're welcome to open ideas. <coughs> would really welcome your thoughts on that as well. Thank you everybody for being here. Thanks Gwen, thanks Stephanie, thanks Greg. Thank you to whoever is still on the call from earlier as well. We appreciate it. See you in May, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.